to our Beyond Jargon 2 workshop, The Next Generation of Communication Strategies for a Sustainable World. This is a reprise of a workshop we did in uh, Barcelona four years ago. It was well attended, people liked it. We thought we'd do it again. I have the help of uh, folks from Google, from Archive, from Futera, and putting this one together. My name's John Francis, I work at National Geographic, and I really care passionately about good communication and want IUCN to be a, a stellar organization in that regard. So what we're doing is some speed dating uh, in the next two hours. We have um, 10 people who get 10 minutes each to tell you what's hot and great in their world with respect to communication. If we go efficiently, we may have time for questions during the talks, but we'll, we'll take that as it, as it comes. Um, I'm hoping that when you leave, you'll be able to follow discussions with the people who presented and that there will be relationships that result. As a member of the Commission for Education and Communication, I think it's, uh, it's an unheralded import at IUCN that we should invest in communication. I think 50% of the budget at IUCN should be for communication and that we're talking too much for, to ourselves and then not enough to the people who make a difference on this planet by the way they choose to act. So that's the premise. I'm hoping you'll be inspired in some ways to do effective communication over the course of the next two hours. Um, our first presenter and co-organizer is Jennifer Austin. She's going to be talking about engaging with a virtual Google Ocean from Plus Hangouts to Earth and Maps. Jennifer, you ready? Great. of Google's Oceans program, and we uh, spent the last four years building a number of educational layers in Google Earth um, to start to communicate to the world what's going on in the ocean through the work of various partners. Um, this project started about three years ago, and it was inspired by Sylvia, her always here, and uh, she's helped us she meet the microphone we can Okay, yeah, sorry, hold on. Yeah, so I said we've, um, we've spent the last four years building a virtual map of the ocean, which you can explore actually under a water surface in Google Earth, and, um, and then just look at the surface in Google Maps. And what you see here is, it's a little dark, I apologize, but you see our Google Earth standalone software, and right over here, um, we have about 20 layers of ocean content, including the explorer, the ocean layer, which is a general education layer with over like probably hundreds of contributors, and that is curated by Sylvia Earle's Mission Blue Foundation. So that content layer in Google Earth gets oh probably half a million uh, views a week, and so it's been a really successful tool to bring educational content about the ocean to start annotated uh, to the general consumer audience. There are photos, videos. Uh, this is a new protected area layer uh, that IUCN curates, where um, nonprofits or photographers can go in and actually add photos. They're not here. Um, I wanted to pick some place marks of content around uh, the area where we are right now, around South Korea. And um, there's a, a layer, if you click on the next point, the Asian sheep head, that shows um, a piece of content from our archive layer, um, which is from uh, Ed Edwards here, his organization archive. And so we've worked with many groups. We have shipwrecks, Cousteau videos, Dead Zones, um, National Geographic, uh, Ocean Atlas overlays, and quizzes about what's going on in the ocean. And it's just been a wonderful partnership with many organizations and photographers, videographers, to start to annotate our virtual ocean. And um, Amber, can you actually dive under Ocean maybe take us to Hawaii or Maui. So we have better data for some areas than others, uh, and that just has been dependent on where we build relationships with various partners. So if we kind of can fly to Monterey Bay Canyon, it's a little dark, but you will see that you can, hopefully, it If you keep double clicking on the ocean, eventually you'll be able to fly under the water, and you'll see a sort of synthesized ocean surface, which is looks a little dark right now because of uh, probably the projector settings. Um, sorry about that. 
Um, but you can go into the water and tilt up with this little, above the eye, yeah, the little arrow. And eventually, if you tilt up enough, you'll see the sort of ocean surface and the underwater topography. So it looks really dark right here, but if you're on your own computer. Or we also have uh, Google Earth on Android and iPhones, phones and tablets. So you can, at home or when you're on a trip, uh, go and explore the ocean or have your kids do that. So it's been a wonderful engagement tool. And then now I'd like to switch to the PowerPoint presentation. Are you standing Korea? This one? Yep. Great. Then you can make that full screen. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit also about some additional tools. So Google Earth and our oceans effort has been a big focus of ours. And then um, we've started since the advent of the new Google Plus social networking uh, software. And we've started to start to enable nonprofits to do interesting things like have Hangouts. So Google Plus is our sort of social networking um, technology. And what you can do is you can have a Hangout of six people, which is like a video conference with six people all talking to each other at once. Or you can put it on air and let anyone in the world join at the same time. So what we're gonna do um, on Monday is host a Google Plus Hangout from within our Liquid Galaxy display downstairs in the Marine Pavilion, which is the Google Earth and Surround. And we're going to host a hangout with Sylvia and, um, and Dan Laughlin uh, and Christina Drady. And we're going to do a little bit of Q&A and, and sort of flying around the ocean with experts who we can talk to about what's important and what's going on. And so the nice thing about the hangout is that we'll project into the galaxy and we'll be hanging out with some people in California. And then anyone who's on Google Plus can join and watch it. So it's been a really neat engagement tool um, that we're starting to play around with and work with conservation organizations to use uh, to engage a, lar a larger audience. So next slide, please. So this is just showing that liquid galaxy display that's downstairs, if you haven't already seen it. And uh, we took this picture two weeks ago for Sylvia's birthday. And what you see right here uh, is a 3D model of the Aquarius. So you can see it's sort of Google Earth and surround. And this is the model of the Aquarius. And there's a water surface on, on, on top. And when you're here, it's sort of like you're on the holodeck and you can fly anywhere in the world, people love to go see their backyard. Um, but it's sort of that we've been working to create tours in the Slope of Galaxy, so tours that are narrated that take you around to interesting features and tell you what's going on. Um, next slide. Another Google technology that has been really uh, successfully used by nonprofits and conservation organizations is YouTube. And we've been using that ourselves for our ocean tours. And you can see um, I've made this playlist in YouTube which are all the sort of ocean, ocean and Google Earth and maps related tours that we've made with partners. And our introductory tour to the ocean and Google Earth has had over 3 million views, which is uh, pretty good for a sort of spatial technology tool. And then we've done um, tours with the Titanic, um, talking about the new ocean map data, the terrain we've, we've published with NOAA on their Indonesia research with Sylvia Earle and her hope spot in the ocean, um, marine protected areas, whale marine protected areas, diving search spots, and pupils, and, and many others. So we've started to use YouTube as a way to share sort of curated tours through Google Earth, telling people the story of what's going on in the ocean. Next slide. Um, and this is just uh, showing an example of one of those videos where we're kind of telling people a specific story. Um, and then next I wanted to talk about a, um, an effort by a group in Australia, Underwater Earth. They've been doing this thing called the Catlin Sea View Survey. They built a special camera to take underwater imagery. And then they've been really active on posting images of the day. Um, they did the first underwater hangout on air and the first sort of under, underwater hangout live with the diver on the Great Barrier Reef when Sylvia and I were in Singapore uh, a few months back. And so they were, you know, anyone could join and talk to the diver. We could ask him questions, he would tell you, look, here's the sea slug I'm holding, and here's this coral. And it's kind of neat. It's like, it sort of makes it more exciting because you're almost there virtually. Um, and they have, in the last few months, built a following of over a million 
followers in Google Plus. So over a million people are connected and watching their updates. And so it's a neat engagement tool. Next slide. Um, this is just showing you the camera system and their effort to collect underwater imagery. Next slide. And this is one of their divers, the manta ray. Um, and some of these sort of images are what they've been sharing on their plus, plus feed every day. Next slide. Here's the <coughs> turtles, maybe a very, next slide. And um, in addition, we have like a standard kind of website which has some of these tours curated um, as sort of a you know, destination place for people to discover some of the content. Next slide. And then the other piece uh, is in addition to having that education layer in Google Earth, Sylvia's Mission Blue Foundation has actually embedded a version that's searchable on their own website. So they have the Earth plugin here, which you can tilt just like you would with Google Earth, and then you can actually search for um, for various topics like whale shark. So um, every night, my son is uh, five, and every night we do ocean tours, and we go to Sylvia's site and we look up whatever he wants to learn about. So whale sharks, great white sharks. He loves poisonous jellyfish. And, um, and we've been doing this for the last couple of years, and my daughter's too, and she watches and follows in, and it's a great engagement tool, and he always wants to learn more, and knows a huge amount about the ocean that he wouldn't have learned about if there wasn't a sort of engaging tool that let him explore and really sort of get a sense of what's, what's out there. And, you know, and now whenever like, there are topics that come up, he's like, Mom, I really want you know more ocean dinosaur tours on Sylvia's site. How come you're not on Sylvia's site? Uh, and so I like send a request to Charlotte, like, Charlotte, you gotta find some ocean dinosaurs. Um, but it's been a really great uh, educational tool for us. And it's kind of funny. There are photos and videos, and whenever there's a photo, he's like, Yeah, mom, it doesn't play. It's like it's broken. Um, all right. And then next, next slide. And then the other thing we've been doing is is working to potentially put some local content from Korea. Um, and we were in communication with the folks who have some videos of those of the soft corals off the coast here. And, um, and so this should be go live hopefully tomorrow. Uh, because when I heard about the whole, uh, you know, sort of Jeju controversy, I didn't know where this, these corals were. I didn't know there were corals under the water. Next slide. And they've taken some beautiful photographs. And the other thing we've done is create a ocean place photos group in Panoramio that lets anyone add underwater photos. So any group can sort of create a login, add their photos to it, and then they'll show up in the photos layers and maps in Earth, and you can get tracking metrics. And then with that, I think there's one other slide just showing an example, keep going, um, of one of those corals and where it's located. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so we hope that more people can use all these tools to communicate with the world about what they're doing. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and on time, too. Um, next speed data is uh, Frank Biasi, who is going to be talking about integrating multimedia maps and mobile to tell stories and engage the public. Are you good, Frank? I think so. We'll see. Okay. I'm gonna try to make sure we get all the right presentations queued up on the right order. Probably use the podium, actually. Okay. That's it. Okay, yeah, well I realized I didn't have enough time to cover mobile too, so I'm focusing in on just integrating maps and multimedia into to tell stories, conservation stories to engage the public. Um, if you want to talk about some really cool mobile stuff, maybe come up to me afterwards. I'd love to talk to you about that. Oh, that's my old version of my talk. Uh, okay, hold on a sec. Yeah, this is totally the wrong version of my talk. Okay. Uh, I think we need to switch order. Okay. Let's have someone else come in and Good. I can fix this because this is. We'll do it. Yeah, That's fine. Thanks. So um, actually, we have a, a our next speaker. It's <laughs> probably, probably better to have a <laughs> um, since Jennifer queued her up so well. Sylvia Earl. And she'll be talking about knowing, caring, acting, making the connection. So, yeah. That last talk was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I did not bring visuals. I'm intimidated after having seen Joel Santori's a magnificent presentation yesterday and anticipating some more great images today from the, the real experts. Images, pictures, artwork, whatever it takes, they really do convey far more than mere words. And I love words. I, I write books, I write articles, I sometimes even dance off into some scientific version of poetry. <laughs> but images are just where it's at. We are visually connected creatures. But having said that, there is no substitute for being there, wherever there is. A picture is worth a thousand words. I hear a lot at National Geographic, but an image has got to be worth at least a thousand pictures, maybe 10,000, maybe there is no limit <coughs> to the way that actually getting a kid out and getting a kid wet at the earliest possible age. And Jennifer, you're doing it. Mm -hmm. and John, I know you're doing it. You've got your kids out on the final blitzes about which we will soon hear more. I was fortunate to be born of parents who themselves were born and raised close to the land in New Jersey uh, on a different planet from the present one. I tell people I come from another planet and they say, yeah, we know that. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is, when I arrived, there was less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. There were more birds, a lot more fish. <laughs> A uh, lot more trees, a lot of things were very different from the planet that we now experience and that we now have to share with the kids coming along. I am such a strong proponent of getting kids of all ages, and there is a kid inside of every human being, no matter how many years you manage to layer on, you're still within everybody, the memory at least, of what it was like to look at the world with that sense of wonder that is natural to a two-year-old or a five-year-old. But approaching the, the teens, something happens. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is. But other things seem to dominate that initial sense of wonder and curiosity that seems innate in humans. Now, I must say that every explorer I've ever known, every scientist, somehow magically maintains that sense of curiosity, that sense of wonder. They're actually kids that never quite grew up. They maintain that, that contact with whatever it is they experienced when they first touched an earthworm or turned over a rock and saw a black beetle scurry out of out from under. But for me, it was getting knocked over by a wave in New Jersey that got my attention on the blue part of the planet. It was the sensation of first not being able to breathe and then suddenly I could, and then I realized that was really kind of fun. But mostly what drew me to the ocean and what has kept me there ever since is discovering the life that's in the sea. And there's life everywhere. And just realizing that is, I think, the most basic discovery that any child, that any person can make, that we're a part of the living planet. And respecting that and understanding that we're a part of that system that keeps us alive. Now, the technologies that we now have available to us to communicate are nothing short of miraculous. And I think about what my grandsons, the youngest now is 13, and then they go on up, all the way up to 21, four of them. They carry in their pockets these little things. So do I. I mean, what other kids, what all kids carry stuff in their pockets <laughs> that give access to the world. Most kids do anyway. Most kids who have access to a cell phone or a, a little iPad or the kinds of things you've heard about from Jennifer just now with more information available than Galileo and Darwin and uh, you name the great intellects of our, of our past, they imagine that they could access what kids today can access. We're blessed with knowledge. And being able to communicate that 
widened, I think is the greatest cause for hope, that we have the power of knowing what we could not know when I was a child. And even if we could know things, we couldn't communicate in the same way that we can today. I'm mindful that when, when the first discoveries with genetics were worked out in a monastery in Europe, Gregor Mendel, it was 35 years before his notes were discovered and made a part of the biological revolution of the time about the whole way of it across various kinds of garden peas and, and, and can predict what the outcome is going to be. It wasn't that long ago in terms of human history that such basic knowledge was known. And, and then the revolution about how the cells actually were the genetics revolution that we now have the capacity to communicate to kids that, that the best scientists in the world didn't know not so many years ago. It gives us an edge that perhaps gives us hope. As a, as a scientist, speaking of jargon, I learned how to speak to my fellow scientists. I learned how to write to my fellow scientists.